But my question is, given all the generosity of the British public in funding this work, is there any way that we can foster better cooperation between charities, universities and farmers to make this cure come quicker, sooner, better to the benefit of those 600,000 people? So that's my first question. And my second question is around culture and toxicity, because it's been a bit hard to escape some of the negativity that there's been. And when you work in a wonderful charity as I do, that's not what you see. And so my question is, how can we best redress the balance? Because the, because the experience that we see, and we've seen it pretty much every week for the last few months, when we've been working with Matt and his ministers and officials at the Department of Health, is unfailing courtesy, unfailing positivity, and unfailing empathy towards people with epilepsy in the context of making sure that they get their medication post-Brexit. And I know that's the, the experience, the everyday experience of many, many other people. So it's a serious question, which is how can that experience of many, many other people be aired more publicly to redress the balance, to ensure that we get the proper reflection of the constructive political engagement that many of us experience? So leaving those two questions hanging in the air, I'm now going to hand you over to Robert to get proceedings under the way. Thank you very much. I'm Robert Colville. I'm the director of the Centre for Policy Studies. I'm delighted to have you here today, and I'm delighted to uh, uh, be talking to Matt Hancock, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, and um, I'm delighted that the Epilepsy Society have, have supported uh, this event. Um, Matt, um, I, I, a year ago we, 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 we did an event much like this in Birmingham, and I, th I, I remember asking you the question about whether you know whether Corbyn or Brexit was sort of what kept you kept you up at night. And yeah. in your speech today, you gave a sort of pretty clear answer to that. You, you sort of said, I, "I have a deep and special responsibility, effectively, to stop Jeremy Corbyn yes. becoming becoming prime minister." Yes, and that is that is still sort of prior priority. Absolutely, one. priority number one for all uh, conservatives, uh, for all who have a. Uh, I, I believe all who have an interest in the future of our country as a, a strong and self-confident nation, um, all who believe that we build on our strengths, we learn from our history, uh, and of course there are problems and challenges that we need to face as a society once Brexit is delivered, uh, and, in, and before then in the uh, remaining uh, uh, 31 days. Um, but by God, we need to make sure that Corbyn and the Corbynistas never seize power. And I wrote that section of the speech whilst I was watching Labour Party conference last week. You know, we all knew, and it's, you know, it's, it's standard for a politician to stand on that stage at conference and say, um, did, you know, look at Labour Party conference last week, weren't they a shower? But this year, it, it, it was worse than ever. It was absolutely unbelievable. And I think because of partly because of the political noise around Brexit, and then because their, um, their conference was interrupted with the Supreme Court judgment, we didn't really, in the press, digest the full horror of it. And I think that it is in, incumbent on all of us to come together to ensure that that never happens. So to, to play devil's advocate for a moment, in your own area of the NHS, what's, uh, what's so wrong with the idea of, um, you know, uh, of um, the government making uh, generic drugs and uh, more cheaply available to... Uh, to, to, to well, there's a, there's a great patients? question. So within the NHS, um, the, uh, firstly, you can't have a strong NHS without the funding that pays for it, and you can't have the funding that pays for it unless you have a strong economy and their plans would undoubtedly seriously damage the economy and therefore damage the funding for the NHS. So that's the first most important big picture uh, response. But then there were individual announcements as well. And I think that uh, the announcement to essentially nationalize parts of the uh, drug supply um, would ultimately lead to fewer drugs being available and less innovation. And that ultimately would not only damage our life sciences industry and the economic damage that comes with that, but I think that it would put lives at risk. Now, I won't go further than that. 
uh, but I think that the, uh, the damage would be very significant. As it happens, the NHS already gets a, uh, has managed to drive down the price that it pays for generics because we are the biggest single bar of medicines in the world. Um, and we've managed to do that and taken through legislation to strengthen our hand in doing that. That's the way to tackle it, not to say somebody's intellectual property is going to be essentially requisitioned by the state because intellectual property is property just the same. I mean, have um, pharmaceutical... I mean, this is a sort of slightly lean question, but I, I've had conversations with people in the pharmaceutical industry who are, gen who are genuinely worried about companies leaving the country if, give it, you know, because it will just become economic and economic for them, allied to other elements of Labour's pro programme uh, about restricting who can supply the NHS. Well, I think this is a very serious problem on two levels. Uh, the first is undoubtedly the, the damage to our life sciences industry, which is so important to coming up with new treatments. And, um, uh, uh, but then the second reason, uh, uh, which is almost more sinister, which is that there's many parts of industry who now are too scared to speak out. They saw what happened to the w water companies when the water companies spoke out against the, uh, the hard left policies of the Labour Party. Uh, and um, we need innovations, don't we? Like quiet wheels on trolleys. Mm. Uh, that's the sort well, of innovation. Welcome to, welcome to my life for the past 24 hours. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we need to look for. Quite, we need um, uh, hover trolleys, exactly. We need hover trolleys invented by well-incentivized, well-supported private businesses. Uh, who can profit from the patents on those hover trolleys for, who a, can, for an who, appropriate period of who time. Who can get a return on the uh, research that they do by having a, a patent system. I mean, the intellect, people, you know, intellectual property increasingly is the, uh, are, are, uh, is the property right of the 21st century. And, that is, and these are the areas where we're going to be strongest in the 21st century. Not um, so much physical manufacturing as we were in the past, although at the top end we are growing very fast in uh, the, the, the really high-tech manufacturing, but it's where it's based on intellectual property. And whether, whether um, in digital form or in services or in those, that high-end manufacturing, intellectual property is the, is the bedrock of property rights in the 21st century, and we undermine that and we undermine the industries that rely on it. So w uh, you're one of the rare ministers in this current government who is still in the same position that they were in beforehand, which means that you were responsible for overseeing preparation for Brexit yes. and, and for no deal Brexit, yeah. sort of before and after. Yeah. I mean, uh, have you, I mean, you obviously, there is a sense that the government before, before was saying, oh yes, we're doing everything we can to prepare for no deal, but actually, not much energy was going into it. Whereas you talk to people who are now in government, and they talk, I don't talk about absolutely the sort of yes. the, a, a sort of almost frenzied uh, effort to like nail down every single problem. So what, yes. what's been the difference in the NH within the Department of Health and the NHS in terms of the, the, the preparations? Oh, the difference has been we've now got much more support from the centre of government, from cabinet office and from the treasury. So um, the uh, the health department was widely regarded as the best prepared department in the run up to the 29th of March. And the reason for that was that when I was asked to do the job by Theresa May uh, 15 months ago now, I said, um, we need to make sure that the health sector, the department, the NHS, and more broadly, and the social care sector are prepared in the event of a no-deal Brexit. And even as somebody who uh, passionately wants a, a deal and wants us to leave with a deal, and I'm uh, increasingly optimistic that we can leave with a deal on the 31st of October, we absolutely uh, must prepare in the event of no deal as well. And that's been my position uh, since, uh, essentially since the referendum and certainly when I became health secretary. So one of the first things I did when I became health secretary was accelerate preparations for no deal. And the good thing is, as health secretary, is that you have one of the biggest budgets in Whitehall. So I could get on with those preparations and work with the pharmaceutical industry who have been superb. And I absolutely concur with what Claire said. It, we, it has been calm, quiet, organized preparation on a basis of, uh, of mutual respect, irrespective of people's views of, uh, of, uh, on Brexit, how they voted, or whether they think no deal was a good idea or not. Uh, throughout that period, it has been a potential outcome. And it is therefore incumbent on those of us responsible to prepare. So one of the first things I did was accelerate the preparations. And then I got to the point where I had to say, 
even if Treasury say the money isn't available, we are going to do what is objectively the right thing to do. And I gave that instruction to the department, and so we managed to prepare ahead of the 29th of March. And we were well prepared, and we've then spent the time since then making sure the preparations are, are more complete. So, so it's not as if there's a sort of acceptable level of excess mortality. Uh, the, the target is that, that, the, that medicines will be there. That you Absolutely. Know. And we have plans to ensure that's, uh, that, that that happens. And obviously, the and we know, uh, interestingly, if you're interested in pharmaceuticals and the supply chain, we, have <laughs> we know more about the pharmaceutical supply chain in the UK than at any point in history. Uh, and, um, you know, there are 12,300 licensed prescription drugs in the UK. Um, I didn't know that before we started the no-deal prep. Um, and um, we understand the proportion of those um, which have a European and EU footprint, which is about uh, just over 7,000. And we know um, the, what areas they're in, and we know which ones have biosimilar other drugs that you could switch to. Um, we know th an extraordinary amount of, uh, of detail. Uh, and we've got on in a calm and sensible way and made those preparations. And the NHS has also been brilliant, as well as the pharmaceutical industry. You know, after all, the NHS is there for when things don't go according to plan, and, um, and, and so has risen to this challenge. And, and the other issue, of course, is, is staffing, that um, the NHS is, is understaffed in many areas, especially many sort of specialised areas. Even if you take Brexit out of the, out of the equation, many European staff e sort of have been uncertain of their immigration status and also just more generally of their sort of feeling that the country doesn't, doesn't welcome them. I mean, what, what, are the, what are the, that is it's a more long-term uh, issue, but are there? Well, well yes, uh, uh, this, uh, the, there are areas where this has been a, a challenge, but there are more EU staff now in the NHS than there were on referendum day. And there are more staff from the rest of the world than there are EU staff, um, that is, EU staff who aren't British. Um, and um, uh, and so, that, so, of course, the staffing issue matters. And, that, and, um, uh, uh, and we've been able to make sure that we get recruitment from elsewhere. But there are still shortages in many areas. And we're recruiting hard. I don't know if you've seen the NHS recruitment uh, campaign that's been, uh, uh, that's been going. It's very, very good, because it's such a it's such a mission-driven job being a, being a nurse. It's very exciting. I think it was competing with the get ready for Brexit uh, slogan. Uh, yeah, so. Michael and I were bidding for uh, space, <laughs> but we did coordinate it. We coordinated it so that we're not actually both trying to better buy the same advert. And You'll be glad to know from a value for money perspective. Well, um, speaking of value for money, um, your, um, you know, um, your big announcement today, obviously, in your speech was the um, was new hospitals, um, investing in infrastructure. I mean, traditionally, the, the problem with the NHS has been that it's been kind of like trying to uh, you know, repair a car while the engine is still running. Yes. And in fact, not even still <laughs> running, just like driving down the motorway at 60 miles an hour. That, yes. um, that whatever extra bits of money can be found just have to go straight into the acutes and yes. into, the, into the big hospitals. Um, you know, and while, you know, impressive and welcome, the, the money, you know, there is the, the demands for, ex for new infrastructure, for new buildings, for upgrades, and, uh, you know, would presumably be near, near infinite. I mean, how do you, hmm. you prioritise and juggle those sort of competing priorities? Well, we do, look, we do need a shift across the NHS to more prevention, and the long-term plan is all about prevention being better than cure, and that means uh, stronger um, primary care and more GPs, and we've got plans on that, and the new GP contract is helpful. I think it, it well, it means more pharmacists doing far, far more, uh, and um, pharmacists highly qualified, highly trained, highly capable, very closely in touch with their local communities, and the new pharmacy contract uh, is, is really important because pharmacists are going to be more like the French model. I'll tell you a story about this, if I may, an aside. Um, I arrived uh, in uh, the department and said we need pharmacies to be doing more to help people and to take the pressure off GPs. Um, and uh, I said, I want pharmacies more like the French model. Because if any of you travel to France very often, and you, if you get ill if, with a minor ailment, you go to the pharmacy before you go to the GP in, in France as standard practice. I, call, I said, we need the French model. Um, and the uh, pharmacy press got very excited about this French model. And um, I... Who, 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 who was she? I, 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 went, I went to the... I think on today of all days, we shouldn't go there. Um, the... Um, uh, the, the uh, uh, the, 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 where was I? Um, my, I then went to see my French opposite number. 
And she said to me, um, what is it about the, the, the French model that you're interested in? And she said, um, after I announced that we wanted to look at the French model for pharmacy, lots of British journalists, they'd taken a lot of calls in the French Department for Health from British journalists saying, what is the French model? And then she said, but the funny thing was, we also so took a lot of calls from the UK Department for Health asking them what was the French model in pharmacy. <laughs> anyway, they, um, it, it, it worked well because we, then have, we now have a new five-year pharmacy contract that, that, um, uh, that empowers and rewards pharmacists for doing far, far more, and we're going to keep pushing in that direction. So more often these days, uh, over the next few years, you will go to the pharmacy rather than automatically going to your GP. That was, I can't remember what the question was, but that's my answer. About, about building, new <laughs> building new hospitals. Oh, yes, so. building new hospitals. That's right. So it, uh, my <laughs> Which may have pharmacies in it them. It was a throat clearer, but, they, but primary care is important. Prevention is important. Pharmacy is important. But, of course, we also need uh, hospitals to be state-of-the-art, and too much of the estate is, uh, is out of date. And there has been a problem for over a generation in hospital building, and the problem has been this that essentially the money has arrived and the question from the department has been who's ready to, uh, to receive a lot of money to build a new hospital? Or even worse, who's capable of signing a PFI contract to build your new hospital? And in, we haven't had an, a strategic approach. So I learned from what we did with roads, where we have a road investment strategy, RIS as it's called, and you have RIS 1 and roads are built in RIS 1, and then RIS 2, and you, if your road isn't done in road, RIS 1, it goes into RIS 2, and you can do the preparatory and the planning work, and you get funded to do that work, and then you get funded for the, to actually build the new road down the track. And then now we're on to RIS 3. So we're going to introduce this approach for building hospitals, a strategic approach where you can make an assessment of need. And, and so for a hospital that clearly do, will need to be rebuilt but doesn't have the plan to, you can get that ready and you can have this strategic approach. So we're going to have the health infrastructure plan. HIP1, six hospitals where they're ready to go, where we can give the investment immediately because they've already got the plans in place. HIP2 will be the, the next, the 34 next, where they get the planning work now, money now, and they can get the plans ready, and they get the go-ahead to build the hospital. Uh, and then a HIP3 in the future, uh, which will be where hospitals can bid in to say, um, I, 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 we will need to rebuild this hospital, and we want to do it down the line. And it's not just hospitals. There's a broader approach. We'll set out all the details uh, in a uh, document. It's all about having a strategic approach to get the best possible value for money. So, so one of the issues that, you're, that keeps on coming up again and again in your job and has actually been a reported source of tension with, with your boss is... Um, in terms of like the balance between sort of rights and rights and responsibilities, mm. in terms of so you're in the news today for saying you think compulsory vaccination, you're you're looking quite seriously at compulsory vaccination. There's also the issue of, of, of the sugar tax, mm. and you know, essentially, to what extent is it legitimate to interfere in mm. people's behaviour or mm. to nudge slash shove people yeah. in particular directions? Yeah. In order for, you know, for, their own, for their own good. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, that's not a question with an easy answer, but it's no, one it that you, you have to face sort of every day. Absolutely. It, uh, it, it's, it's clearly, uh, the answer is clearly a balance, and there's a question of where you fit on that, sit on that balance. Um, but it, it's, a right, it's the right question. It's a legitimate question. And in fact, I think that sometimes in the past, the debate around the health service has focused too much on only the rights you get from the NHS. They're rights that I am proud of, that, it, that we treat people according to need, not ability to pay. But that is essentially a right from the state, that if you ship up at an A&E and you are a British uh, taxpayer, um, then you will be, well, if you ship up at an A&E, you'll be treated what, whatever, uh, and, um, uh, and, if, and you can get your elective surgery from the NHS free at the point of use. Quite right. Um, but we also need this debate about the responsibilities that we have. And in a sense, you know, the state in the UK ensures the whole of society for our health needs. Um, and um, people have responsibilities too. Um, and there's a, then there's a legitimate question about what is the state's interest in pursuing those responsibilities. Now, as a conservative, I prefer the, um, the responsibilities that are targeted uh, and that are specific to individuals. So take alcohol consumption, for instance. 
In terms of alcohol consumption, uh, about 95% of people who drink alcohol have uh, no particularly strong um, acute consequences, so long as it's done in moderation and it's reasonable. Um, as, and, um, but there are about 5% for whom it is a serious health problem that has a direct impact on them having to come to hospital. We should be really focused on those people when they present with a problem to their GP or at hospital that they should get the full treatment that they need and support and psychological support and the rest of it. Um, whilst I'm, uh, and at the same time, I'm against a minimum user unit price for alcohol because it effectively penalizes people who want to buy their so, alcohol. So, so that's, that's, that's in, sorry. Um, but then there are other areas where, it's, where I take a slightly different approach. So on, on sugar, you'd be... Um, so for instance, on sugar, we introduced the uh, soft drinks industry levy, as it's called, the sugar tax for short. Um, and the thing is that you have to raise your tax from somewhere, whether it's income tax or, um, uh, or, ta or the soft drinks industry levy. The question of where you levy your tax is separate from the question of how much. And now, I'm a low tax conservative. I'd like taxes to be lower. But since we do have to raise taxes, because only two things in life are certain, um, we have, we, why not do it and raise it where there is an incentive effect, which as conservatives we all understand, the incentive effect um, to drive um, better um, health outcomes. In the case of the sugar tax, a, it's driven reformulation. It's taken 29% out of, of sugar out of, um, out of those uh, drinks. And that has a consequential direct impact, positive impact on levels of obesity, and the evidence around that is incredibly strong. So, um, so that's my, uh, so I'm a supporter of the, uh, of the, of the soft drinks industry um, levy. Um, but I think that it is better the more targeted the approach uh, well, can be. So, so the, the reason I, it, it struck a chord, so um, I've had some experience of the NHS in the, the last year, which I probably wouldn't have wanted to, to have had. Um, as a result of this, I've been fundraising for uh, liver, di liver disease, also immune hepatitis in, in particular. Um, and um, one of the things one of the doctors said to me, look, it's great that you're fundraising and you know, it, it's, it's fantastic. But to be honest, the single thing you could do most do to save most lives would be to talk to your friend Matt Hancock. I said, well, you know, um, and, and, to, um, and to persuade him to bring in a minimum unit price for alcohol. Now that's not something really? that, that's not something I would be, I would be, so ideologically I'd, I'd shy away from, but it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating sort of, it's a, you know, the, the, the decisions, those kind of decisions that you make have, you know, all they sorts. They do. And, you know, and similarly then you talk to other people in it now who say, look, you know, we have an absolute epidemic of fatty liver disease coming down the, coming yeah. down the pipe, you know, it's the one disease which is, you know, you sort of one sort of major category of disease which is sort of growing in in importance, and actually that's where you should be focusing. You know, it's, it, these are heavy issues for you to have to deal with. Well, you know, Robert, I said on the stage earlier in my main speech that we have to show and understand the emotional connection that people have to the NHS. And, you know, I think everybody in this room would just reflect on that in the question that you asked um, with such bravery, because we all, you know, because um, I know what you went through. I think you're very brave for raising it. And, um, you, uh, and, it, and it, it means that questions in the NHS are very emotional because the impact has such an impact on people's lives. And the response I'd make in terms of um, liver disease is that the, ris the, cor the thing that we need to do is reduce the consumption of alcohol that causes... Um, the, the, the biggest problem. The 5%. Yeah. We, and therefore focus on the 5%. Um, and, um, but it also is a reason for, ta for the state having a, an interest in how people live their, um, in how people prevent ill health. Um, and I think the strongest of these is smoking. So on stroke, smoking, I take a different approach to on alcohol. Because I think that there is, because I think that the road to a smoke-free society is a is a road that we ought to travel, um, and I also take a different approach when it comes to children, because where because we it, it's perfectly reasonable to take a nannying approach to children. Uh, children need nannying. That's why we call them children. Um, and um, there's a so for instance when it comes to um, being uh, tougher on 
uh, measures that help tackle childhood obesity. I think, I think there, uh, the state has a particular role. And on that, on that theme of responsibility, obviously your, your brief extends to social care. And so one of the, you know, Boris Johnson announced on, on the steps of Downing Street, he, you know, this was something he was going to tackle. Um, yes. know, there, there would be a plan. It would be a great plan. Yes. Uh, it's um, going to be a great plan. Um, but obviously there's a tension there. But you know, we, I mean, we, we did work on this with, with Damien Green MP. And you know, when you look at it, people think of social care as like the NHS. They, they mostly think that they should get it for free. But actually, we probably can't afford that because it would, you know, you'd be adding the demographic pressure of an aging population which the NHS is already coping with, you'd be adding on a sort of second, second dollop of that. In addition, you know, there is a, philo you know, there's a philosophical, ph philosophical argument that why should, you know, why should I, who can perfectly well afford to pay for my own social care, be able to sort of claim, you know, to, to sort of claim from the, claim from the state when I, you know, if I want to, if I want to have sort of, um, you know, Michelin star, I, well, I don't have this level of money, but if I want to have Michelin star chefs cooking my meals in the nursing home. You know, I should I should pay for that myself. I mean, it's a, again that we come back to that tension between sort of personal responsibility and, and, the, and the state's responsibility. Where are you currently sort of sitting on that? I'm currently working with the prime minister on what we will propose. And no one will have to sell their own home. Yes, the good the um, the the uh, what I'm really enjoying about this work at the moment is that uh, the prime minister and I completely agree uh, that uh, we shouldn't be having and so many people having to sell their own home. You know, he said on the steps of Downing Street um, uh, that uh, this is one of the uh, problems that we have to tackle. And um, I feel very strongly that uh, the problem of people having to uh, sell their home to pay for their care. Um, and it, it, it's because um, your home is something that people often have worked all their lives in order to achieve, and in many cases it's their... Uh, it's their main asset, um, and I, I, uh, as a conservative, I back um, the, uh, both the, the, the aspiration that's behind that and also this deep human instinct to uh, look after the next generation. Um, but having said that, um, we, uh, uh, or and rather, having said that, we need to make sure that social care is properly funded into the future. I'm not going to say any more in terms of where my thinking's up to because... Um, we are looking forward to saying something in public in due course. And um, we, we're supported here tonight by the Epilepsy Society, and it's obviously, yes. obviously one of the—it's it's sort of one of those, as you said, one in a hundred uh, diseases that you know people don't. People, I mean, what are the just sort of almost off the top of your head? What are the sort of the issues and that you like that that you've been surprised by that you think we we should do more or, or could could do more on? Because obviously. Your office must be filled, or your inbox must be filled with people saying, "Hey, there is this thing that we've completely ignored and neglected, and we should we should do more on." I mean, yes. Are, are there sort of ones which particularly strike you as as areas that we we need that need more focus? Yes, I think um, the fairest way to do this is to try to take the approach of looking at areas that haven't had that focus, um, and um, uh, th th I, I think that. You know, the, the, in a way, the correct thing to do as the Secretary of State is to ensure that the light is shone fairly everywhere to all conditions and that you don't try to prioritise one. Uh, but when you find one that hasn't been had its fair um, uh, amount of focus, then you try to um, uh, lift it up the agenda. For instance... Um, uh, aortic dissection is a very serious problem, but very few people had heard about it. Um, and uh, Pauline Nathan, the MP, raised it with me as a, for, because of a very personal uh, case. Um, and um, the, in terms of the proportion of interest and in research and focus it has to the impact that it has across the population as a whole in terms of the uh, serious injury and death, it is... It, it, it simply hadn't had that attention, so I tried to raise the attention a bit. But in a way, you know, the, the, what we need to do, what is fair is to look across um, all of the conditions and make sure each of them gets their fair share of support. And this is true of epilepsy, um, and it's true of um, some of the of, of liver disease and the rare liver diseases in particular, um, to, ma to make sure that they get the fair share of attention and research funding that comes with that 
uh, and all the rest of it. So I try, I try essentially not to have a... F uh, <laughs> favorite condition is the wrong phrase. I, a condition that I favor more. I try to, that I, in policy yeah. terms, I try to make sure that um, we objectively follow the clinical facts. And my role is to say, let's try to solve these problems, let's, let's make sure that we get the research that we can and have the NHS as strong as we can, rather than having a sort of a, a, a particular view. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm no, not no, sure no, whether I, I articulated that no, particularly I mean, well. It's, it's, and but, and it, it, I could be about to embarrass myself hugely, but I, I'm, I think Pauline Latham is not a Conservative MP, is that? Is that she, right? is. she is. Damn it! Yeah. I was going to say this is a perfect example of you, of, of you reaching out across the aisle to uh, to, to um, you know. Yes, as, she's as, an absolutely as wonderful. Said, sorry, MP sorry, I, 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 I haven't come across. Her, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you away. But um, so, and one, one final question before we open it out to, to Q and A. Um, I was reading, so the the, 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 the sort of the, the, the conservative and actually Blair. Although right, action sorry. that we took on um, on brain cancer that was brought to the, uh, everyone's attention by Tessa Jowell is a good example of working yeah, across okay. the arm. Yeah, phew. Um, but the, um, one of the, the, sort of great, the great sort of conservative and Blairite sort of innovation in the NHS was this idea of competition. Um, that, um, pa you know, admittedly some of them were too demanding, but the idea that patients, that the, 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 the best way to drive change was through patient choice and patient control. Um, it feels like we're sort of moving away from that. And in fact, some of the reports about the transformation plans that are being developed by NHS England yeah. basically involve a, a, a shift away from that. Um, as, as the Centre for Policy is, so yeah. can you reassure us that competition and, in, and cons the consumer pressure will still have a place, will still have a wider place with Very, very the important, this. Um, because there are proposals from the NHS um, to change some of the um, rules around the how contracts are tendered for within the NHS. That's partly because the way that they're operated at the moment are incredibly legalistic and bureaucratic uh, and often get in the way of people working together who really ought to be. So I have seen examples of um, a, a GP's practice on the, in, on the same floor in the same building as the community health provision and they're not allowed to talk to each other because of uh, the legals around this. Um, and um, so I'm open to these proposals that the NHS have brought forward. But what, I, but what I'm absolutely clear about is that the patient choice, uh, the pac patient choice must stay and is important. And the NHS haven't proposed to change that because the patient choice is incredibly important. And, and presumably also you'd reject the Labour idea that the only path for it, that every NHS service must be provided by the state. Well, it's uh, a, this is totally impractical because, you know, who is going to provide the, um, uh, the pencils that are used in the NHS or the iPads? We're not going to have the NHS building their own iPads. Uh, we're not going to have the NHS uh, um, uh, 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 creating a, um, a, a, a clock factory uh, in order to provide the clocks that are used with the NHS. I just use these two as absurd examples. The, of course, the NHS employs a lot of people and it also buys a lot of stuff. What about the drugs? I mean, I know they want to nationalize part of the drug supply chain, but they've only mentioned this for generics. Um, there are, uh, the NHS always buys things from, uh, the, uh, from private companies. Uh, and I imagine even under the most um, left-wing proposals, um, there, won't be any, there won't be any private companies to buy things it, from. Well, it's totally impractical, the idea that um, every single purchase that the NHS makes should be from an NHS uh, provider of that um, item. It's a, um, the, the, from its inception under Bevan, the NHS has provided services. Let me give you another one. GPs, GP practices, most of them are private partnerships. Um, and so are the, are the Labour Party saying that they want to abolish our GPs? I think we need to know. Excellent. On which note, um, let's open it up to, uh, to question. Blimey. Um, uh, just wait, if we could get some uh, sort of from, from left to right in the, in, in the front row here. Um, well, sorry, near, the, near the front. Um. This is just a microphone coming. Yeah. Hi. I'm very concerned about these 5% of your patients with a liver disease. Alcohol is a huge problem. It doesn't only affect the liver, it affects the brain, it causes epilepsy. It affects families, we get breakdown of families, it affects road traffic accidents. It's a huge problem. And it actually opens a huge can of worms. 
It's very closely linked to mental health, and people with alcoholism have other mental health problems as well. And I'm sorry to say that my experience as a doctor is that we are grossly lacking decent mental health services in this country, and also patients who use alcohol are often rejected by mental health services, and they're told, until you stop your alcohol, we can't see you. And this is a vicious circle. Mm. I've seen schizophrenic patients who are hallucinating, and they're using the alcohol in order to drown out the hallucinations. And I think alcohol should be way up above cigarettes. Cigarettes, you harm yourself, maybe anyone who's standing by you. With alcohol, you have the whole disintegration of the personality, the family's a problem, and I think it's a huge thing that you should be looking at very, very carefully indeed, not just saying, well, it's just the 5%. We need an alcohol treatment program, and we don't have one. Madam, can, we, can, I, we, can, we, can, we, can we just take a, a no, few a really, points? It's a really good point. And in a way, um, in a way you, I think we are violently agreeing with each other because um, the, 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 all of those case studies that you mention are exactly the sort of people who we should be supporting more, uh, certainly through mental health services. Uh, and I was glad that we could announce almost a billion pounds extra yesterday for mental health services. Um, and th those who need the support of the NHS because of, their, um, of the problem of alcohol, uh, their use of alcohol, are, exa they are exactly those who need more support. That, was, that is precisely my argument. Um, and, um, but there are also many, many people, the majority of people, who drink alcohol, pay high taxes on it, um, and... Uh, do so without damaging uh, their long-term health. And the approach that we should take is not to say we should treat everybody the same. It's precisely to get the support and treatment that we need uh, to those individuals who need it most. Okay, um, can we go across the second row? Um, and, uh, the, 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 the speedier people are, the um, more time we'll have for okay. questions from others. Okay. Good evening, Martin Boniface. Uh, first of all, as the father of a fantastic young man with severe intractable epilepsy, I was very encouraged to hear that epilepsy might actually get the spotlights shining on it. So thank you for those comments. Uh, a different area I'm interested in, and that is of people with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we know there are statistics that show that the average general population in England and Wales, 5% will die before the age of 50. If you have learning disabilities, it's more like 23%, and people with learning disabilities typically have a life expectancy of 28 years less than the general population. Um, I'd like to understand what the government's views are on what can be done and what will be done to address what I think is a pretty disgraceful affair for people with learning disabilities. Yes. And I then, sorry, sorry, sorry uh, uh, to, 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 oh, unless, you, unless you want to just... Well, I think, one, uh, look, I, I strongly agree with you. Um, I think also um, we talked about social care often in the political debate um, when people talk about social care they automatically think about social care amongst um, the older population in their declining years and in fact Mayor Culpa I was guilty of this in the, my response to Robert's question uh, whereas the support for those with learning disabilities that are needed through social care is an area of intense focus for us at the moment um, both in terms of domiciliary care, but in particular ensuring that people have the appropriate residential care where that's necessary, where there are some very significant problems that we're working hard on. The individual cases are often quite difficult, and so it takes time to resolve them correctly. But it's an area that, with Caroline Dynage, the Minister for Care, we're doing a huge amount of work on. Um, and so essentially, I accept the premise of your question, and I, uh, I hope that we can make some... Um, significant improvements in my time as health secretary. Thank you. Um, thank you, Matt. My name is Vicky. <laughs> like Matt, I've also not Matt, sorry, like Martin, and, and I've also got a strong interest in the field of learning disability and autism because I have learning disabilities and autism myself. Um, in turn, um, well, I've got a couple of questions, actually. So we, so we only have time. I'm really sorry, we only have time for one quite short question because um, there's so right. many other people who want to ask uh, the Secretary of State. Um, um, well, the uh, big one is you were saying, yes, prevention is better than cure. Oh, oh, um, 
um, in terms of um, physically getting ill. Um, um, but what about um, um, prevention in terms of people getting mental health health problems? Because, um, as I'm sure you're aware of, uh, lack of support for people with autism can lead to mental health problems. Yes. Um, um, uh, and, and in worst case scenario, those without that support, they can end up in an assessment and treatment unit and end up being abused like we saw at Walton Hall yes. and Winterbourne View. Yes. Yes. Thank you for your question. I think it's incredibly important. And you're, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. When I was talking about the prevention agenda, I absolutely mean this in both physical and mental health. It's incredibly important. Um, and this, the announcement I mentioned yesterday of an extra almost a billion pounds is for community mental health facilities because we have not had nearly enough responsive enough uh, mental health uh, facilities in community settings. Um, and it's a big part of the long term plan to turn that around um, precisely for some of the reasons that you mentioned, not only uh, to make sure people get the support, but also to make sure that they don't end up in much more uh, severe crisis and ending up in inpatient, uh, inpatient settings. So I, I strongly agree with you, and I hope that we can make progress on this journey. Um, so the lady there and then the Hi. gentleman behind her. Um, Mr Hancock, I'm from the Pharmacy Press, which you spoke about. Yes! Um, who, who loved Did you French. call the French uh, um, It was my predecessor. I'm now doing her role. So okay. Yes. And I was just wondering, all the pharmacists I've spoken to have said the new model is great, um, the new funding deal, but you've frozen funding for five years. How can pharmacists deliver that? They feel like they just do not have the time or money to deliver the service-based contract. So I was just wondering what you have to say to those people. Yes, yeah, so the new contract, I'm glad to get the feedback that the new contract is great. That's the same feedback as I've, um, and as I've got. It also allows for an expansion of services. So if people do uh, deliver more services, then they will get more return within that. So the, uh, the existing envelope was based on a flat cash agreement. Uh, but, the, uh, but the scope within it for lots more services, and I hope that we'll see lots more services as pharmacies are used more and more within the NHS family uh, to deliver for patients. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to get the feedback. I'm absolutely convinced that there's more to do. I'm very excited about the progress we're making with, uh, uh, with, with, with making the most out of our, uh, our community pharmacies right across the country. Uh, hi, Matt. Um, one of the, the focuses of your sort of tenure as health secretary has been about opening up and sharing you know, health data. And you know, the polling shows that people are quite happy to um, share their data where they can see a benefit either to themselves or to society as a whole. But yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, there's still a sense of nervousness, nervousness around it. And how do you think we should sort of you know, move that agenda and take people on that journey yeah. so they're feeling much more comfortable yeah. about having that control and sharing their health data openly? So this is a really good question, really important question, and it ties actually to the prevention agenda because one of the reasons we can be more targeted with where we prevent ill health is because there is better availability of data. But you're completely right that we have to take the public with us, and, that is by, and we do that by maintaining trust. And trust is at the heart of the plans that we've got to, um, to allow health data to be used to save more lives, which it does already and will much more in the future. But it's got to be done in a way that protects people's um, privacy as well. Now, I'm confident that we can make good progress on this, not least because uh, you know, we all have lots of sensitive personal data. In other areas, like with our financial data, which for some people is more sensitive than their health data, we've made, um, we've made further progress. Um, and um, I, think that, I think that also we make progress by motivating why it's important. For instance, explaining that allowing your data to be used for research purposes is the number one ask of most of the health charities, including the Epilepsy Society. Um, you know, the, people like um, you, Claire, can actually motivate why this matters um, better than I can, uh, because you can explain that it helps. It can help to um, uh, to make people's lives better, um, and so trust and consent have got to be at the heart of it. 
Uh, and, um, uh, and I'm very enthusiastic, as you might know, about the power of new technology to save lives. Uh, it's got to be done in concert with the right, with people uh, and clinicians. It's, it ultimately, can make, it's got to make clinicians' lives better. In fact, the number one ask we get in, um, in the health service around data, um, not uh, from people who work in the health service, is can you make my log, on, log in quicker? Um, and um, that may, you know, uh, some, some of you laughed, um, and I wasn't surprised. It sounds at one level glib, but when it takes you 20 minutes to log in and you're often chucked out for no, for no apparent reason, and then it takes you another 20 minutes, you know, the improvement in the in clinicians' lives that you can get from improving, I've got a few people who look like doctors who are nodding. You're a doctor, so no, but you are, were nodding. Um, whoops. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the improvements can be very s significant, both for clinicians to give them back the gift of time uh, and also for the research that can, uh, 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 that can help save lives in the future. So continuing my Rachel Riley impression, um, one or two from the back, please, Jethro, just to uh, share things out evenly. Um, hopefully my question actually follows on in that theme. Um, you were speaking earlier about the importance of private sector involvement, especially to drive innovation in the NHS. I was wondering if you think that same argument applies when you think about curating and analysing NHS data, or whether that can be done internally, either in NHS X or in the department more broadly. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited about NHS X as, uh, as the uh, institution to drive this agenda, uh, both the ethics and the privacy and the uh, technological advance. Because um, ultimately... A good, a, a good data architecture and good policy around data makes it m both more secure and more usable. It's a fallacy that there's a trade-off between the two because badly held data will be both insecure and uh, unusable. Uh, and there's a huge role for the, uh, for the NHS itself to be doing this work. Um, the uh, the, the, the uh, 250 million announcement that we made in the summer uh, for an AI lab within the NHS is precisely to do this inside the NHS so that we can hire some of the best people from around the world and, and, and bring, those, uh, uh, bring those, this new technology to bear directly. But I'm, I'm also open to doing it with innovative companies, but there we've got to make sure that the privacy arrangements are good, that, that the NHS sees, some of the, sees the benefit, not only the clinical benefit, but also making sure that... Uh, if, if companies are going to make um, the, 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 the contractual arrangements are right, uh, and we're doing a lot of work on that that's being led by Baroness Blackwood, um, who is absolutely brilliant on this agenda. So there is an upside, but I'm also enthusiastic about doing it within the NHS itself. Hi, Matt. My name's Helen Davies from Alzheimer's Research UK. Um, I'm sure with your fantastic powers of observation, you'll have seen on the big screens in the main conference hall, we're running our Just 1% campaign. So we're calling on government to put 1% of the total annual cost of dementia towards research to find effective treatments. At the moment, government's putting 0.3% towards uh, research. To put that in other words, so for every £316 we're spending on the NHS, social care and informal care, we're putting just one pound towards research. And if you're going to crack and solve the uh, social care crisis, the only long-term sustainable solution is to find effective treatments for dementia. So will you support our Just 1% campaign uh, and help move towards treatments sooner? Thank uh, you. Uh, absolutely brilliant question um, and um, a very uh, a noble goal, um, which we are... Um, uh, which I'm very open to. I can't commit to it today, um, but we uh, we announced obviously the uh, the capital funding for the um, for the 40 hospitals um, at uh, at this conference. We have not yet agreed the research budget over the years to come, uh, but that is a discussion that we're about to enter into. And so I think the timing of your question uh, was incredibly uh, uh, apposite. Um, and I hope that uh, I hope also the question about the the, the data feeds into the research because much of that research will be driven by the data uh, as well. So I'm um, uh, I, I can't I can't commit, but I'm trying to give the I'm trying to give a a, 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 a very warm I, I reception mean, I mean, just, to the I mean, question. Based on the I mean tonight and sharing a previous event with you last year, I mean 
in some ways, your job must be the sort of the, one of the most depressing in Whitehall because because so much of it has to be gently telling people, you know, that there are so many demands. That there is there is only so much money, and you know, people because people just must keep asking you for and these heartbreaking stories that you then have to have to respond to. It's it's definitely one of the most emotionally engaged and emotionally involved. Um, people come and tell you about how, when the NHS was there for them. People who have had very serious uh, um, health problems or loved ones with health problems um, tell you about it. But it's nearly always positive and highly motivating, Robert. It really is, um, because, um, because people really love the NHS. Um, and, um, and, and so, yes, of course, you've always got to trade off things. I'd love to be able to answer the question uh, just now with a straight um, yes, but that's the part of being in government is taking the responsibility for having to um, make the uh, to having to get everything buttoned down before you can uh, give a go ahead in public. Um, the um, but the other thing is that when you do do positive things, my God, the reaction you get is fantastic. Not always in the newspapers, but yeah, you know, I spent Saturday phoning the chief executives of the hospitals that are getting rebuilt. And I had the hospital chief executives who've been in the NHS for 20 years bursting into tears on the phone to me. You know, that was quite emotionally draining, but in a really, really good way. So um, I wouldn't say it's the most depressing, but I would say it's one of the most emotionally involved uh, portfolios in government. Cool. And we've got time for a couple more questions um, uh, from well, the gentleman in the wheelchair and then... Hi, Matt or Mr. Hancock. Uh, Whichever you prefer. Matt. My name's uh, Dan Burden. I'm from the Spinal Injuries Association. Um, it was really good to hear at the beginning of the talk about um, staff in the EU, um, staff in the NHS from the EU. Um, one of the workforces which often is missed out of the conversation is actually um, the care workforce mm. and be that for um, social care, or mm. I'll give it a plug because it's not often mentioned, NHS continuing healthcare. Yeah. And one of the issues that um, our members, spinal cord injured people, are now bringing up with us on a daily basis is the fact that their carers who've been trained to deal with their specialist condition are now going back to the EU. Um, I was just wondering what you thought about that and actually what plans we had to make sure that people were still able to get specialist carers to meet their condition. Yeah, it, it, it's incredibly important uh, and we've made some progress on it with the, under the new um, administration since Boris became uh, Prime Minister. Um, and uh, clear, look, clearly there is going to be a change in the immigration system. Um, that was a big part of the EU debate um, but one of the good things is we will then, as a country, control our immigration system around the world, um, and um, we can then make our choices. So I make the argument that we should attract people to this country who can do um, great service, um, and, um, and, and that's true right across the board um, and is a, a really important part of the debate. Uh, we need to have... We need, I think by controlling the system, we can have more social um, uh, permission and acceptance for uh, making the argument uh, for people coming from abroad in order to care for us. And I think that's true in, in, in all of the caring professions. So um, I'm going to uh, ask Claire, as the sponsor's privilege, to uh, ask I, either ask the last question or to give us some concluding remarks, whichever oh. you, you feel most... OK, okay. well, f may I start off by saying thank you, because for all of us who work in health or social care or related um, trades and professions, it is an emotionally engaging task, and you have our support in what you do. And thank you very much for giving us your time. So let's say thank you. <laughs> And my final question is really, which is, d I hope you never feel inhibited or, or unable to ask for help, because you've got a difficult and challenging job. And all of us in this room, in our different ways, are here to help you, whether we work in, in hmm. the health service or in social care or in charities. We're, we're here to help you. And if you can think of ways we can help you, we're here. Well, that's, uh, that's very kind and very humbling, uh, really. I'm, I'm acutely aware that I'm only one of the um, several million people who, 
who, who work in um, health and social care in its broadest sense. Um, but the really um, energizing thing about being health secretary is it is such a mission-driven job. The NHS is a mission-driven organization. The charities that are involved, the businesses that are involved uh, are, are mission-driven. And we have a, uh, a mission that we can be proud of, which is, to, uh, which is to help people to be able to live their best life. And so it's a, it's a, it's a joy and an honor to be part of it. Thank you, Claire. And um, I'll let you to join me in thanking Matt Hancock.